question before the House is will the House adopt the amendment offered by the gentleman? On that question from Lehigh County, Chair recognizes Representative Ritter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to state my opposition to Representative Friend's amendment and to urge this House to reject this proposal, which trivializes some of the most important and difficult decisions that a woman can make. I find it ironic, ironic that I'm in my third year in the House of Representatives and I'm here debating my third Abortion Control Act. May I remind my colleagues that we did this in 1987 and in 1988, and here we are again in 1989. May I also suggest to my colleagues that it is likely that we will be here in 1990, 1991, and 1992 debating this issue, or until a majority of the members of this body say enough is enough. Pennsylvania has some of the strongest abortion laws in the country on the books and has provided a litany of United States Supreme Court cases that have overturned unconstitutional anti-abortion statutes. Why are we doing this today? Because we want to send still another case to the U.S. Supreme Court. What we are doing is deciding whether or not to provide the U.S. Supreme Court with the case that will overturn Roe versus Wade which made abortion legal almost 17 years ago. If that happens, ladies and gentlemen, we won't be here debating specious abortion regulations which are designed to harass women and doctors. We will be here deciding whether or not abortion should be legal in Pennsylvania. If you think you are uncomfortable now, and if you sense more being at stake as you cast your votes today in terms of your political future, just think about how painful it's going to be, both personally and professionally, to decide in the not too distant future if abor abortion should be legal or illegal in Pennsylvania. That is the issue. For the record, let me make it very clear to you that nobody likes abortion. I am not advocating and have never advocated abortion on demand after viability. I want to reduce the need for abortion by reducing unintended pregnancies. I believe that this country wouldn't have the highest abortion and teen pregnancy rate in the developing world if we took sex education and family planning more seriously. But unfortunately, we don't. I believe that the best way to prevent abortions is to help women not get pregnant in the first place. Many women who experience unintended pregnancies have used contraceptives that failed. 50,786 women in Pennsylvania made the decision to have an abortion in 1988. According to the Population Crisis Committee, Mexico, our neighbor to the south, has approximately the same number of abortions annually as this country does, about 1.5 million. But all abortions in Mexico are illegal. An estimated 140,000 Mexican women died last year as a direct result of consequences of illegal abortions. Almost one in 10 Mexican women who have abortion dies. By contrast, in 1988, six women died in this country where abortion is legal. Again, by voting for this legislation, you will be taking another step towards a vote on whether or not abortion should be legal in Pennsylvania. Now, Representative Friend would have you believe that a woman can have an abortion during all nine months of pregnancy and that that is what pro-choice people support. This could not be further from the truth. Of the over 50,000 abortions performed in Pennsylvania in 1988, 93.5% were performed in the first trimester of pregnancy, according to figures from the Pennsylvania Department of Health. There were 127 abortions from the 23rd to the 26th week of gestational age, which begins two weeks before conception in this legislation. In all of Pennsylvania last year, there was just one abortion in the third trimester. Any procedure performed after the 24th week is considered a premature delivery and every effort is made to save that child if it's possible for the child to survive. These premature deliveries are performed because of serious health complications to the, women, the woman or her child. Saline abortions and D&Es are not performed after viability in this state or in any other state. So the abortion that Representative Friend refers to that can be performed up to 30 seconds before birth simply means that the baby will be delivered 30 seconds earlier. That's all. By now, we have all heard Representative Friend's recitation of the terrible story of Dr. Melnick and West Park Hospital so many times that we can probably repeat it word for word. Let me say at the outset, in this instance, I do agree with Representative Friend. What the doctor did was wrong. 
illegal, and punishable under the laws of this Commonwealth. The doctor was charged, tried, and convicted under the infanticide provision of current law. That story is an aberration, but one that suits Representative Friend's purposes in attempting to convince you that women are having late abortions as a matter of whim. Believe me, they are not. So what's wrong with this bill? Let's start with the definitions. We have defined gestational age to mean a probable two weeks before a woman conceives. So the prohibition on abortions after 24 weeks gestational age is 22 weeks or less post-conception, which bumps right into a few cases where amniocentesis results may show severe fetal anomalies. We have also now defined unborn child and fetus as meaning the same thing from fertilization until live birth. Now the doctors that I have talked to call a fertilized ovum an, an embryo until eight weeks post-conception, and then they call it a fetus until it is born. A representative friend wants us to think of all fertilized eggs, even at the moment the sperm enters the egg, as an unborn child. Now, I don't doubt that the potential for a child exists, nor do I contest the notion that there is life there, but I firmly believe that the woman's rights are more important until that time in the pregnancy when the fetus can survive outside the woman's body. I also believe that religious differences of opinion must be respected as different religions approach the issue of when life begins from different perspectives. From the beginning of time, women have born and raised children. Why can't we trust women to make their own decisions about whether or when to have a child? Must we continually subject women and their doctors to unnecessary, expensive, and time-consuming delay in order to satisfy the wishes of my anti-choice colleagues. Make no mistake about it, this bill will not prevent abortions. It is not designed to prevent abortions. All it will do is add time, money, and hassle to women in Pennsylvania seeking abortions and the few doctors who still provide them and provide the all-important challenge to Roe versus Wade. Women are not stupid, as this bill would have you believe. When a woman makes up her mind to have an abortion, she knows what she is doing. That doesn't mean she takes it lightly. That doesn't mean that there are no emotional consequences for her actions. And that doesn't mean that it's an easy decision for her to make. But the important point here is that it is her decision to make based on her judgment and the circumstances of her life. It is not for us in government to make that decision, to interfere and intrude in one of the most personal and private decisions that a woman can make. A woman will involve her husband in the decision-making process if theirs is a healthy relationship. Who are we to intrude in something so private and force someone to write down in their medical records that their husband is not the father of their child, that they fear physical abuse, or that most intrusive of all, if the pregnancy results from spousal rape, the woman must report it to the police. This is not the role of government in the marital relationship. The 1989 version of the Abortion Control Act which 73 of my colleagues saw fit to sponsor, most without seeing the actual language, also requires that a woman wait for 24 hours after receiving informed consent before she can have the abortion. Ostensibly, this waiting period is to give her time to think about what she's doing so that perhaps she can change her mind. Now, the odds are that this woman has been pregnant for six weeks to two months and possibly longer. She's decided what she wants to do. She's called the clinic for an appointment which I'm sure she's not looking forward to. And now we want her to wait for another 24 hours or more in most cases, since clinics don't perform these procedures every day in many areas of the state. We want her to wait for another 24 hours after receiving informed consent. For what purpose? Or should I say, for whose purpose? Last year, women from each and every county in this state had abortions. Most of them couldn't have them in their own communities because there are no abortion providers there. So they have to travel, just like pregnant women in rural areas frequently have to travel for prenatal care. There are abortion clinics in Allegheny, Chester, Dauphin, Delaware, Lehigh, Montgomery, Philadelphia, and York counties. That's eight. A few, abortion were, a few abortions were performed in 17 other counties. The residents of the remaining 42 counties have to travel, many for considerable distances. For some, it's easier to go out of state. Now we will have them either make two trips or stay overnight. More time, more expense, more travel. Pennsylvania has the largest rural population in the country. And for those of you who represent rural areas, you know how difficult it is for, women, uh, for people to get health care. 
Now we have these women who must leave their communities to get this procedure coming to a strange city for an abortion. Their husband, boyfriend, parent, friend, or sibling may or may not be with them. They may have to run the gauntlet of anti-abortion protesters to get into the clinic, and now there will be another 24-hour wait before they can get the procedure. Will the anti-abortion protesters be taking down license plate numbers, as they have been known to do, so that they can call these women's families? Will they follow these women back home or to a motel to try to convince them not to have an abortion? This provision, this 24-hour waiting period, was struck down by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1983 as unconstitutional harassment. It will add time and expense to the abortion procedure. No big deal, you say, so she has to wait 24 hours. Tell that to the women who live in the real world. And what shall we do about sex selection abortions? This is a terrible practice in other countries like India and China, but we don't do it here. Now, Representative Friend, in one of his amazing memos, compares this to the NBA rule, no harm, no foul. This is not a basketball game. This is not trivial. Women in our country do not have abortions for this reason. But think about it. The reason this provision is included in this bill is not to stop this horrible practice. It is included because this section directly challenges Roe versus Wade. That's what's going on here. Will someone please tell me just how it is that a doctor who risks the felony conviction for performing an abortion for this reason will know that this is someone's reason for having an abortion? Can you imagine the cross-examination that would have to take place to prove that someone actually did this? This provision will not pose a particular problem for the vast majority of abortions performed in Pennsylvania because they are done, as I said, before it is possible to detect the sex of the fetus. But what of sex-linked genetic disorders, disorders like hemophilia or Duchenne's muscular dystrophy? Although we say in this section solely because of the sex of the unborn child, how is someone to prove that it is solely for this reason? Who makes that determination? Many of my colleagues will be sharing the responsibility today to de debate portions of this legislation, and I will not attempt to do it all now. But there is one piece of this legislation that strikes me as particularly onerous and very mean-spirited. In the prohibition against abortion after 24 weeks, there is a particular exclusion for suicide. It actually read in the original version of the Abortion Control Act, which we saw for the first time less than three weeks ago, no abortion shall be deemed necessary to prevent the death of a pregnant woman if such death would result from suicide. I can only hope that most of my colleagues didn't know this language was in there before they sponsored this legislation. Now it reads, no abortion shall be deemed authorized under this paragraph if performed on the basis of a claim or a diagnosis that the woman will engage in conduct which, res which would result in her death or in substantial or irreversible impairment of major bodily function. Now, this change only addresses women who have, in fact, attempted suicide, but makes no exceptions for women who have been diagnosed with mental illnesses that make them suicidal. I encourage you, once again, to read the case studies from Choice in Philadelphia that you received from Representative Hughes about the women who attempted to self-abort or kill themselves rather than carry to term. Are we to say to the doctors, psychiatrists, and social workers who deal with these tragic situations, Yes, tell this woman to go ahead and kill herself and her baby. We can't help her. Do we say that to the woman who was so desperate in Philadelphia that she stabbed herself in the stomach? Or to the woman in my hometown who took five packs of birth control pills? Or the women who tried to overdose on cocaine and alcohol because they couldn't figure out what else to do? As I said, what about women who already have diagnosed mental illnesses? Let's please remember that in situations like this, people are desperate. We owe them compassion and understanding, not cruelty and heartlessness. Think of what it must be like for a psychiatric social worker to tell the woman that she's sorry, but the legislature said that if she Mr. Going Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Gentleman from Center County, Mr. Letterman, for what purpose does the gentleman rise? Mr. Speaker, I have my doubts if the Speaker is staying on the amendments. I've been sure. listening, and I would think that the day is going to be long enough if we don't stick to the amendments. If you're going to do it, do it point by point, and let's hear it. But they let's will not indeed. just ramble on about every doctor in the United States. We don't need to hear that. The day will be indeed long if we interrupt speakers. The lady is speaking on the amendment. The speaker determines that she is on the amendment. Mr. Speaker, 
What's yourself, Jim? What purpose, the gentleman rise? I will continue to insist that we stay on the amendments. All members must stay on the subject before the House. The subject before the House is the amendment. The lady is in order and may continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Think of what it must be like for a psychiatric social worker to tell a woman that she's sorry, but the legislature said that if she was going to kill herself because she couldn't have an abortion, that she should just go ahead and do it. How many women will be permanently impaired or will just die in their attempts to do something to seek help? Talk to some of the people who deal with these situations all the time and ask them how hard it is to get the system to believe that someone is really going to do this. I entreat you to get rid of this provision. Mr. Speaker, I want to conclude my remarks by saying that this issue is one that has the potential to tear our legislature, our state, and our country apart. It appears to have the potential to change the political landscape in the state. It has already assumed some aspects of a civil war, and I expect it will get worse before it gets better, unfortunately. It's my sincere hope that our activities today will reflect thoughtful deliberation. This issue is too important and affects too many lives not to pay attention, read, question, and consider. In the aftermath of the Webster decision last July, the Supreme Court changed everything and nothing at the same time. The major body of law dealing with this subject has not changed, and the Supreme Court itself is being pulled apart over this issue. This amendment before us today does not incorporate any provision of the Webster decision. I intend to offer an amendment today to use this U.S. Supreme Court's language from the Webster case about viability testing, which the sponsors of this legislation have not done. I ask my colleagues to resist the pressure to be the ones to give the court the test case to overturn Roe. And I ask you to realize that we may reap a bitter harvest from our actions today. For too long, many of my colleagues have been comfortable in voting against a woman's right to choose because they always thought the court would be there to back them up. That may not be the case anymore, and we will all have to live with the repercussions of what we do here today. I urge my colleagues to look down the road ahead and imagine a state without safe and legal abortion. Imagine the pain and suffering that that would cause thousands of women and their families in the years ahead. And finally, Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to remember one thing. Trust the women to make these important decisions for themselves. I urge a no vote on the Friend Amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question is, will the House...